Welcome everyone. I'm Laura DeFranco, the CEO of Brave Healer Productions, where we have a mission to wake the world up to what's possible for healing one brave word at a time. And here today to help me with that mission are some of the amazing authors of a new book that we have coming out. This book is called Love Initiation, Learning the Language of Soul. You guys, this was a special project. Our authors traveled from all over the world to Egypt, where we spent two weeks together exploring sacred sites with Egyptologist Emil Shaker and his phenomenal team and guides. It was a transformational experience, and the book will have a very extra special energy for our readers, so I'm super excited. Um, to welcome these three authors into the first interview about this. I have Marion Noon with me. She's a life coach and counselor with The Quest, Seven Steps, art therapist, author, and yoga instructor. Melissa Lee is here. She is a UC Reiki master teacher, integrated energy therapy master instructor, crystal Reiki teacher, master teacher, certified yoga teacher, meditation leader, psychic medium and registered nurse offering heart-centered healing tailored specifically for each of her clients and ns shakti miss natasha is with us she's an international best-selling author speaker and mentor focused on shining her light brighter to illuminate the path for others. Y'all feel the power I have in my Zoom room today? I hope so. We're going to have fun with this. Marion, you're going to start the party off. Tell us about the amazing chapter that you wrote. So my chapter is chapter 15 in the book, and the title is Sacred Sobriety. <clears throat> and I oscillated back and forth on whether or not actually I should write about this because it is such a vulnerable share um and oh I'm getting emotional <laughs> I always get emotional when I share these things out loud um so my purpose behind it well first the reason why I chose to write it was because we all know that like the thing that we're most afraid of is the thing that we should do right and that's kind of the whole core value of this entire group network of brave healers as we step out. And as Laura always says, we share our brave words, right? So I, <clears throat> in the last couple of years, have been through a lot of life transition. And one of those things is choosing what I've termed sacred sobriety. Um, and through sobriety, not only just practicing the steps or however that individual reaches sobriety, but also utilizing that clear mind space to connect to the divine right? And you, purifying the vessel. And I've been involved in a lot of spiritual communities and um, free thinkers and really incredible people in the last seven to 10 years of my life. And one of the things that I witnessed and noticed within myself, obviously, right? The external mirror is always a reflection of self, is that I was blocking that channel. So, and many don't prioritize um, what you would call purifying the vessel, Right. So I chose to make a commitment to myself to purify the vessel, to strengthen my connection to the divine. And when I chose to step into this path, guys, miracles abound. I, I cannot even share with you how the impossible became possible from every angle of the universe in ways a person could not imagine. And in this share with you guys, I become vulnerable and, and I get down to the raw nitty gritty of, you know, where the reality of where I was at this breaking point and how the divine showed up for me in ways that I could receive and how I managed to maintain that connection to follow the call down my path, which led me to Egypt which was my childhood dream from the age of five years old. I was obsessed with the Egypt Egyptians. And as I was sitting in this space with all of these beautiful people, I realized, wow, okay, it's been God all along. <laughs> so yeah, that is my chapter. And that's my why I really want to encourage people in the world to purify the vessel and really tune into what I've termed in the chapter, the God whisper. It's that deep intuition and that nurturing, loving relationship that we all inherently have with the divine. So 
That's you know, I think sometimes the block for people to purifying the vessel is that, of course, when you stop numbing yourself, you have to feel everything, not just the good stuff. So want to say anything about that? Takes a warrior in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, so it's the, the this is actually what led me to become um, a sacred alchemist, which basically is going into the deeper layers of the psyche right it's much like uh, internal family systems and inner child work in a way but it goes and it meets each traumatized aspect in the subconscious layers of the mind and you alchemize this into the gift because trauma always subsequently comes with a gift right so this led me to realize that in the combination of purifying the vessel alongside going into go the deeper layers of the psyche and the unconscious and alchemizing these gifts is where this whisper becomes the loudest. So it's actually just like I said at the beginning, full circle, the fear is exactly what you need to do, right? It's the same with the psyche. You know, the psyche talks you into not going there because it feels like the pain is too much or you have to relive the experience or you have to sit in the viscerality of the first occurrence or the multitude of occurrences of the same trigger, right? But that's what needs to be done, right? So we purify vessel, purify psyche, and what happens is alchemy, right? And the alchemy leads to ascension and self-actualization and true connection to the divine. I love listening to you talk about this. And, and, and of course, to all of you watching, um, we know it's not easy. <laughs> and and summarizing it in a couple sentences is like, whoa, yeah, it makes it sound like so simple. But um, you all here today, you know, you've walked your walk for decades. You've dedicated your lives to this journey and this path. And I am so grateful and honored to be here with all of you um, sharing this information for people to help them feel some hope that, you know, we know it sucks sometimes to do what Marion's talking about, but, but there is a reward on the other side of that. If you can embrace, you know, this journey and all the different ways you're being challenged to do it. Marion, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Melissa, tell us about your amazing chapter. Hi, I have chapter 17 in the book, which is titled In the Arms of the Divine Mother, I Am Home. Subtitle is Finding Freedom Through Forgiveness. And this is a really personal story for me too. In the name of being vulnerable, I um, am talking in this chapter about a trauma that I sustained as a youth. And um, I think a lot of times after people have experienced traumas, they tend to live inside this shell or this blanket of shame or um, uncertainty in the world. And so we tend to really put ourselves in a, a little box and then we um, live there and we just kind of bounce around the walls of this box that we put ourselves in. And we can't really progress beyond that until we can look back and truly forgive all the little pieces the people and the circumstances that took, you know, um, that all had to come together for our stories to be the way they are. Once we're able to work through that forgiveness, we can leave the box, we can really truly experience freedom. So when I'm talking about in the arms of the Divine Mother, it's because, you know, I lived with this trauma for probably 15 years or so. And then I was just kind of casually um, somebody mentioned to me a sacred journey to Mexico. And I was like, God, I don't know anything about that, but that sounds cool. And so the more I learned about it, I was like, you know, I think that this is what I need. This is where I need to go to step out of my box, to really spend the time away from family, away from society, to just focus on my trauma and work through it. And in doing that, I made this incredible connection with the Lady Guadalupe, which I never would have even considered having a connection with before. And through that connection, I was really able to forgive and find freedom. And so from that moment on, I've been really happy to share my story with people little bits at a time and to help bring other people outside of that box that, that we all walk around in after trauma. And, you know, even just since sharing this story a little bit with a few people, specifically with, with women, because this story is related to a traumatic pregnancy that I sustained, it's been really 
fascinating to me and humbling to hear how many people have come to me and said, thank you. And here's my story. So that's really what I'm doing this for, because when I was living in this blanket of shame and stuck in this box, I just wished somebody else could see me. Somebody else understood what I was going through. And now that I'm starting to share it little bits at a time, I'm able to be that for someone else. So hopefully through reading this, other people will realize, hey, we don't have to live in this blanket of shame. We can just truly step out, find some forgiveness in our hearts. And, you know, part of that, like you're talking about the, the challenge, right, of being sober, the challenge of finding forgiveness is like, hey, these things happened to me and I've been angry about it for a really long time. And I don't want to let the other person or to let that experience off the hook per se. So a lot of the forgiveness work is in understanding that the forgiveness is just to set your soul free, just to free yourself. It doesn't let anybody else off the hook. It doesn't forgive any, you know, ex- behaviors. It just forgives the energy attachment to that event. So forgiveness has been a massive learning um, curve for me. But when you can truly understand that the forgiveness is for your own healing, it's for your own heart, it's to set yourself free, and then let the universe take care of the rest. It's a really wonderful place to be in. So hopefully, I can help other people get here too. For sure. You know, so you're making me think about that box, right? And if you're somebody that's been living in one, it, it's, it tends to feel more constricted and smaller as you go. And it may feel pretty cool for a while, but there is a point where it starts to feel like, oh my gosh, it's right here. It's closing in on me. There's a discomfort. But Melissa, sometimes that's because we, we throw up the box for protection. Mm -hmm. And just like clearing the vessel, forgiveness is for warriors, right? But also just because survival, like, so what, what, anything else you want to say about that piece of it? Yeah, I think, you know, particularly with this topic, because I, as I briefly mentioned that this was a traumatic pregnancy, the topic itself was so controversial that I felt like I couldn't speak about it because I was going to be judged from every single angle that there was. And as I moved through life and started to hear other people's stories, it just made me um, put those walls up even higher. And um, I'm hoping now that we can, you know, help people understand that the protection that we once put up is great for us in the beginning, but then we get to a place where it's not protecting us anymore. It's limiting us. So taking a step back and, really um, diving deeper into what is it that I've been through? What is it that I've done to cope? And how is it still helping me now um, is a a really good first step. And for me, I realized that what I was doing was staying silent and I just kept it quiet and I kept it quiet. And in the beginning, that was great for me. It made it really easy to not have to have the uncomfortable conversations with people. But in the end, it was really just limiting me and keeping my voice silent in all areas of my life. It wasn't something that I was able to say, okay, I'll just keep quiet about this topic. Instead, I just became a very quiet person in general. And I really um, turned inward in all aspects. So realizing that, hey, you know what, that coping mechanism of not talking about it was great in the beginning, but now it's kept me from even living my life or having a a conversation freely um, was a big realization. So I try to encourage my my clients and my students to really reflect back and say, okay, I understand that you've been carrying this anger or whatever it may be. And here's probably why you've been carrying it and how it served you. But where are you at now? And how is it serving you right now and today? If it's not still helping, then maybe it's something that you're ready to face. Yeah. Yeah. Hence those walls getting tighter, right? Melissa, thank you so mm-hmm. much for being here today. Thank you. Um, NS Shakti. Do you want me to call you <laughs> Natasha or should I call you by that amazing new name of yours? I don't know. <laughs> we want the world choose. to know. A cho- I get to choose. Okay. Um, I just like Shakti goddess. How's that? Tell us about your chapter. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> of course. you. <laughs> Tell us everything, um, Natasha, about your beautiful chapter. So first, since you started with the Shakti, um, I will start with that, that thanks to Brave Healer and my place in the whole universe of uh, Brave Healers is what gave birth to my NS Shakti name. So um, 
in May of uh, 2023, I brave his first children's book. I took a pen name because there is a Indian woman who writes children's books called Natasha Sharma. So I had to find myself a name. And so I was born here in the Brave Healer universe <laughs> as Shakti. And then I signed up for the Egypt trip in September. And Shakti basically took on her own life and became this conduit for divine channeling and unfolding, which culminated in my... um stepping into my power in Egypt. So that the whole thing is in the Shakti. It is in the Kundalini energy and the divine feminine. And it's no surprise that, the, that that those of us are on the call today are on the call because, you know, I mean, Melissa mentioned the divine mother and that's what it's all, what that's what it comes down to. The ultimate divine creator, which is the mother um, and the rising feminine energy and girl power and all the magical things that are brave healer and we have some conscious men who are there as well with us and that's also awesome because we need that balance um so my chapter is about ref talking about stepping into that power um uh, marion mentioned the psyche and that's what it's about that all the stories that we that we come up with from our life experiences from childhood make our reality it's the box that Melissa was talking about and the walls and the traumas and the patterns that come from the trauma and then it la it ends up being a cacophony of different recordings of voices that are in our head and when we start stepping on the path to self-awareness and we sit for meditation for the first time the first challenge is dimming the noise finding the silence and that whole thing and so in the middle of that, what is your true voice? Which is the wisdom that's coming from the divine? Which is the wisdom that's coming from traumatic aspects? What is, uh, it all gets very confusing. To, so on the journey to finally, as you're unlayering, and it's a journey, there's not destination, but along the way to find a state of being where you're able to separate which voice is what. That's what I have managed to reach this point in my journey. And that's what I share in my chapter, which is called Inner Wisdom Versus Inner Critic. Um, and part of that is when you can actually separate those voices and you get the inner wisdom is when you're free to step into your power and your purpose in this life and being the best version of yourself, self-actualized on your way to Nirvana, Moksh, who knows what? It's just really exciting. <laughs> the next book, the next chapter is just going to be so epic. This discernment you're talking about is everything. It has been in my life. I call them ninja moves of awareness. And, um, you know, the discernment word um, does get used a lot, but I think it doesn't get enough credit. Is there anything else you want to say about the importance of that? You will recall what I wrote about in our book, Your and Mine, and also a lot of other authors, but definitely Your and My Book, Mindset Mastery. And there I talk about the, pra the, the practice of radical acceptance. And that is where the key is. To finally say what Melissa's saying, that, you know, the forgiveness that it doesn't mean that it didn't happen to us, whatever it might be, positive, negative, all experiences, doesn't mean it didn't happen to us. For But for us to separate that from our present self and to be able to let go of that and then be in the flow of today, which is acceptance and surrender. And surrender to me does not mean a giving up. It means a giving in to the flow of what is rather than putting up all this resistance of what we expect yes you i mean in that last sentence is everything <laughs> it's everything you guys <laughs> right there we can stop this interview right now like the, so y'all are dropping such golden nuggets of wisdom today already thank you natasha thank you so much for being here with us today um, so we we wouldn't be here today without our lead authors, John Mercedes and Julianne Santini. So I want to say a huge thank you to them. Thank you for the mission of love initiation and for dreaming this up. Gosh, 
over a year ago and beginning the project with setting the energy and intention way back then in terms of the people and the energy and and all of the people around the world who have supported us on the journey in the writing and now as we move on to publishing this beautiful book so huge thank you um, to you john and julianne for what you saw that vision you saw for love initiation we wouldn't be here without you so um melissa i'm going to pop over to you what's the most important thing you want people to know about the language of their soul That's a really good question. Um, I think that what I want people to know is that, you know, we do have that soul voice, like Natasha was talking about. Sometimes we're like, is it source? Is it myself? Whatever it might be. But listening to that inner voice is so important. And I think particularly in my chapter, when I was living in silence that whole time, I was feeling really tortured by this. What I really wanted was to reach out and to communicate with people and to connect with another person that felt the same way I did. And it's been interesting that once I started doing that, and I did make all these connections, it wasn't a personal connection, it was a soul to soul connection. So my language to speak with my own soul, then can help to communicate with another person's soul. And, and that connection is so strong, so beautiful. So I hope to, um, to just encourage people to listen to that inner voice and to trust it, trust yourself. I love the way that you started off that question. It's going to take people to a deeper understanding of what a relationship means. Um, thank you for that, Melissa. All right, Natasha, how about you? So what's this, what's the most important thing you want people to know about the language of their soul? That when you learn to separate the voices and you learn to listen to the voice of your soul, that act that 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 truth of the purpose of our life i think that gets a bit diluted like pretty much all the stuff that comes out into the world and then people have their own assumptions and then it sort of dilutes the actual uh intention behind it so when we say purpose of our lives why are we here why have we been born in this incarnation at this point in space and time and I think we get lost in the story of figuring out why, like what is that purpose? I think we get lost there. And to just be and to just trust that there is a purpose and it'll come to us. It's not something that we have to go out and find. The more we're looking for it and scrambling for it, the more it will elude us. So the more that we are in acceptance and flow and forgiveness and love and hello, joy, our, you know, which is our biggest lesson in Egypt, like enjoy the joy, excuse the grammar, which is what I keep on telling you, <laughs> but yeah, enjoying the joy of life and just letting it unfold and, you know, letting the soul continue on the mission that it chose to embark on. Yes, I love that. Um, you know, you're just making me think about it, if I were to answer it this way, trusting that truth, there's a feeling to that. So we could call the feeling joy, but for anyone listening, that's gonna feel different in your body than it does the next person's body. So that's your truth. And if you get to discern and really get how that feels inside of you, gosh, you guys, like I, I stopped caring about the why a long time ago. I'm just like, after that GPS that sends me to the joy, I'm like, that's a cool feeling. How about right now we just focus on that? I love that. I love it. I love it. Marion, how about you? What's the most important thing you want people to know about the language of their soul? Well, Natasha spoke to a lot of how I feel about that, about we all, as humans, our brains are wired to make everything such a task, you know, and by making it a task, you're doing the opposite of what you're trying to achieve. And I actually wrote about this in my practice section. It's a guide to help people, um, a baseline guide to help people sit in that silence and just start with the practice of listening. 
and be okay with stillness and don't attach to an outcome, but just the practice itself, just like being in the now and, and experiencing the joy in the now, right? It's all similar, same different words. But another thing I'd like to add to that is for me personally, I love to look at it through the lens of like an adventure and experience compassionate curiosity. So I allow my inner child to come online and I'm a very visual person. So as I'm tuning into this joy or these positive emotions presently in the now, in my stillness, I open that field of possibilities through the lens of a child's heart. And that to me has made it fun. You know, it's not about trauma is trauma, trauma is there. We're going to do the work that organically shows up in our awareness and it's delivered by the perfect teacher because when the student is ready and the teacher appears and you continue on your path, but the whole time when you zoom out and you look at the, the larger perspective of your book of life and your story, it is quite adventurous. There's ups and downs and in-betweens and all arounds, right? So when I came in, when I stepped into the energy of the inner child while listening, it connected me on a deeper level. It made it fun. It made it, um, all possibilities were there because as a child, we're not jaded by the world experience and life experience and trauma. You know, the first time you see a new flower, you're like, wow, look at this. It's like seeing the universe for the first time, every step you take. So it's the same thing. Go into your inner universe with a compassionate curiosity and a child's lens. I love that. I, I feel that way about flowers now and the stars <laughs> <laughs> and the moon and trees and animals. I could go on and on. Okay. So that's, and I think that might be one of the marks of a master and also a brave healer is that mindset that you just talked about of, of a child and being curious, right? I love that. Oh my goodness, ladies. Um, just a quick thank you to all three of you, not just for saying yes to this project, but for really taking my challenge to write those vulnerable stories and lay your hearts on the pages for the readers, because that's what is in this book, you guys. And you're going to read these beautiful stories, and then you're going to read a practice that you can practice. You have a master teaching from our authors in each chapter. This book is such a gift. And I appreciate all of you for really stepping up um, to, to tell your stories like that and to teach. You all teach every day. You talk to your clients and you coach and you teach, but it's quite another thing to put that in black and white in a book in a way that gives the reader that palpable, practical, powerful, it's a lot of P's, isn't it? Experience. And you did it so brilliantly. So Natasha, next question is for you. Travel is transformational for so many reasons. So I want you to inspire us with one of the powerful moments you remember from Egypt. And I'm gonna ask you three to not go into a super long story about this. Like if I was gonna say this in my way, I'd be like, mm, it was sunrise at the Hashaput temple when I turned around and saw that golden light lighting up the entire cliff and sacred site. I felt magical. And I need you to keep it that brief. I know it's so challenging, but Natasha, what would yours be? Okay. I'm rising up to the challenge. <laughs> and <laughs> Thank you for giving, in, uh, inspiring me with that beautiful description. <laughs> I was there and right now. Um, okay. So for me, it was when we were on the water taxi in the dead of night, it was absolutely dark, but there was a full moon that was on the river. And then this huge black dark structure rose out from the darkness. Uh, but everybody's attention was on this brightly lit thing that we thought was the temple. But then I saw this shadow and I was like, that is so familiar. What is that? What is that? And then the water taxi turned around and I stood up and I was just staring at it. And then a lot of people were turning around and looking, what's she looking at? It was like this thing. And then our water taxi turned around and we went there. And that was Philly. That was the ISIS temple. And I was like, what? I thought it was abandoned. I just, it just, it just caught my attention. And then when we stepped out, when I stepped out onto that land, I felt that I'd come home. 
Mm. And I heard ISIS say welcome home. I knew you guys were going to be good at this. Marion, tell us yours. I think for me, um, the pinnacle of, well, there's so many, like you said, pinnacles. It's just, it was so transformative, but the most feeling I experienced was in the King's Chamber when I was singing because prior to leaving I had a visual a vision and I channeled the song in my shower and I just started singing it and I could see the the whole entire chamber and I knew I was in the py pyramid and it was like wow this is beautiful but then when it actually got there I was like I have to sing and as I was doing that I just felt like I something unlocked and I was set free it was like it was like all of the trauma was erased, all of the human story was er er erased, and I was one with the divine and just in a pure space of joy, love. It was like a bird's eye view of everything coming together to one zero point for me, and everything's been different since that moment for me. <laughs> the group of, um, of us who we all practiced chanting and singing, but there was a smaller group, including Marion, who were really singers in the group. And we um, arrived in many of the temples and the locations um, being told that we weren't really allowed to chant or sing, but doing it anyway. So yeah, it's breaking the rules, right? But those moments were transformational for me um, to receive the vibration of the singing inside the temples, you guys was absolutely phenomenal. So when Marion started to talk about that moment, I was like already getting goosebumps because I can, I can hear it, but feel it. I can feel it, right? Melissa, what was one of your moments? I know there were so many. There were so many, but this is perfect the way that you've lined it up because my uh, moment really is connected a lot with Marion's moment. When we were in the King's Chamber, we also had an opportunity to lie in the sarcophagus and then come out of it again. And before that, we had been, you know, walking in and walking up and doing all these different things. So everybody was very sweaty and physically uncomfortable, but so grateful to be there. So as soon as I stepped into that sarcophagus and started to lay down, I went, oh, okay, this is one of those moments in life that you're not going to get again. And as I laid down and looked up and saw people standing around me, looking down on me, I said, okay, you will have an opportunity to do this again once you've passed. And I had this vision of, okay, once I transition, there will be some kind of funeral for me. People will stand around me. I'll hear singing, like I'm listening to Marion's voice now in this sarcophagus. But when that moment happens, I won't have an opportunity to stand up and step out and start all over again. And I do now. So that two minutes felt like two hours of just laying there and listening to Marion's voice. Beautiful, beautiful, by the way. Thank you for that. And then stepping out, I truly felt like I was able to step out and then just take my life in whatever direction I wanted because I've been given this amazing opportunity to start all over. So yeah, that was probably the most transformational out of dozens of transformational moments over those two weeks. There were so many, um, so many. And another thank you to Emil Shaker, his team of guides, the, the people who took such generous care of us um, every day, every moment of every day. Thank you all for helping us feel safe and loved. And it just, there were so many moments uh, that were transformational for me, but even just realizing how well we were being taken care of was, uh... okay. I have one more question for all of you and it's really to kind of serve our listeners today. You know, brave healer authors have dedicated their lives to this healing journey. I'm so grateful and honored to be on this path with you all. You practice awareness at a level that impresses me every single day. So, Marion, on a day when everything feels impossible and overwhelm is kicking in, Share one simple practice that helps you and might help a listener. 
Uh, I go outside, I take my shoes off, I put my feet in the dirt, I sit down, I touch the dirt with my hands, I just close my eyes and breathe for as long as it takes. Sometimes I'll even lay down and huff the dirt. <laughs> Anything to do with earth. And like, even if I have restricted earth, if there's a tree on the street, I'll go to the tree. <laughs> You know, because there is divine intelligence that's been existing since the beginning of time on this planet, you know, and it, it's there's there are answers there when you feel disconnected. It's a way to step back in for sure for me. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Nothing like the earthing, the forest bathing, the sand in the toes. I'll take it all. I'll take it all. Melissa, how about you? What's what's the one practice when you're just having that impossible day? So, um, of course, much like my my friends here, a lot of earthing and grounding practices, connecting with nature is great. But one thing I have found more recently, um, and it's also one of those, it scares me and I hated it, so I figured I should do it, and then realized it was pretty incredible, is ecstatic dance. Just truly shaking and moving and Letting the movements be as wild and chaotic as life is in that moment takes all that energy that's just stuck in you and lets it out. And then afterwards, you can be so much more relaxed and centered to approach the same situations, but from a more centered place, it seems a lot less overwhelming in that, in that sense. One of my favorites. And what if we just <laughs> did that in nature? We'll get two for um, yes. Nat <laughs> Natasha. <laughs> what is yours? Natasha, you're going to close us out today. Tell us that one practice that you would offer to our listeners who are having that impossible day. So it's very strange when you first posed that question. My heart literally went thump, and my mind went blank, and I was just like, what? Suddenly the concept overwhelm was so alien to me now. Like I'm so in the flow. I'm so sad. I had to re-remember what it's like to be like that. And I was like, what am I going to answer? What am I going to answer? And then I'm glad I went last on this question. <laughs> but to be fair, I I mean, the grounding, uh, uh, the dance thing, yep, yeah, for sure. So in that way, it would be music for me. Like there is specifically, and I've written about that in my chapter, it starts out with the music that I'm listening to as I'm writing the story in Love Initiation is there, legit. Um, so I hear on loop the soundtrack of The Last Temptation of Christ, which is a album by Peter Gabriel called The Passion. And there's just something about that music that just is restorative and whatever I'm going through, if it's like just dealing with too many people who are not on the same vibration as me, which gives me a headache, it relieves my headache. And then I'm at peace. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh my gosh, you guys, this book is so, it's full of practices and we're giving, we're giving you just this little taste of these tools that we use in the everyday um, but there are so many. And so that's part of what we're doing here is we want to give you the toolkit. We want to give you the ideas of things that really do work and can help you on those on those days. Oh, authors, um, Melissa, Natasha, Marion, thank you so much for what you do in the world and for being here today to share it with everyone. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Laura. Thank you, Laura. So you guys, um, if something that was said today is giving you the goosebumps or you've got a question or you want to carry on the conversation, what I want you to know is these are way more than books. This is a generous, loving community that is ready for you to reach out. So drop down into the show notes because I have all of our authors hooked up with their links and they're waiting for you to ask that question, to connect with them, to see what they're up to. It's a lot of amazingness. So please connect with them and explore. And of course, you're all invited to our book launch party for love initiation, learning the language of soul. We're going to be gathering on February 14th. Why not, right? Valentine's Day, 10 a.m. Eastern. We're going to have all of the authors with us celebrating this book and dropping some inspiration and wisdom for you. 
You're going to find some invites for that on the Brave Healer Productions Facebook page, which is linked up down below. And of course, if you're listening to this interview after that date, well, the book is out and ready for your purchase. We hope that you'll hop over to Amazon and grab it. And lastly today, everyone, remember your words change the world when you're brave enough to share them. So it is time to be brave. See you next time, everyone.